The aim of this video is to explore the context of, of philosophy in Shakespeare's era uh, and sort of the time, the ways of thinking that underpin the play Hamlet so that we may understand what was going on in Shakespeare's mind when writing it or in the minds of his audience. Um, the second half of this idea, the, the three revolutions idea, is not mine. It comes from a lecture series called Literature of Crisis, uh, which was delivered by Michael Evans at Stanford University in 2005. If you want to listen to any of those, <coughs> that lecture is, is available in full on iTunes U, so you can download it and listen for yourselves. So now get out some notepaper and a pen. Uh, and start taking some notes. We're going to go through uh, some of the major thoughts uh, and beliefs that were going through um, people of the Renaissance era's minds um, and, and what might have shaped the thinking in Hamlet. So in order to really understand the ways of thinking of the Renaissance period, we really need to go back further and look at the the feudal values of the medieval period because that's really where a lot of the beliefs uh, of Shakespeareans still um, emanate. So one of the central beliefs uh, that originates all the way back to Pl Plato and Aristotle in the ancient Greek periods um, <coughs> was the belief in the great chain of being, which essentially was a really strong hierarchical structure for looking at how the world was, was held together. So if you picture a strong chain with God at the top, followed by the angels, and they're all ranked depending on what sort of angel they are, so archangels and versus seraphs versus other angels. Uh, and then we move into man, and top of the, um, in the rank for men would be the king um, in, in uh, Henry VIII and, and later England, uh, and then followed by sort of the nobility, um, and then going down towards, all the way down to kind of criminals on the bottom. And then below man, is <coughs> a, a range of beasts, and they're organized depending on what quality uh, of animals they are. Um, and so we, we'll see that, for instance, in the play when, when Hamlet talks about his mother, uh, and he's, or he, yeah, he thinks about his mother, and he is disgusted by the fact that she's not grieving long enough for her father. He says a beast that wants discourse of reason would have grieved long, <coughs> would have mourned longer. Um, and so showing there how she's moved down on the chain of being further down. So essentially the belief in the chain of being was that if you removed one of the links, for instance if you, uh, as is the case in Hamlet, kill the king, then what you end up with is chaos because the chain will break and will have complete disorder until it's all restored. Another strong philosophical um, belief in the era was the belief in the music of the spheres. Um, this is a bit more complex in terms of its actual, um, how to visualize it, but, but I like to think of it, <coughs> which is rudimentary and probably not entirely correct, but I think it's an easy way to picture this. Uh, if you picture the universe as a series of, of circles, of spheres, um, and essentially they're created by each, uh, each of the planets and the, and the way that they revolve uh, within the, the firmament, which is the outermore, outmost barrier of the universe, and so each... Um, revolving planet or, or body in, in the heavens makes a little circle and if you picture that each of them makes the sort of sound that if you if you run your a damp finger on the top of a wine glass that little um, note that rings out. So if you have different sized glasses they all kind of play out a different type of sound and that sort of symphony that you get from all those glasses was sort of the belief in the music of the spheres that they created a harmony in the universe. And again, if you were to distort that and break one of the glasses, then you would have a chaotic society. A much more straightforward belief system to, to cope with and understand is the belief in the Wheel of Fortune, which essentially was the idea that man's fortune and, and life was controlled by the turning of the Wheel of Fortune. So you might go from being a rich and happy and wealthy person to someone of great misery and and unfortune uh, simply by the spinning of the wheel of fortune and that was controlled by the goddess Fortuna who who just 
at a whim whenever she felt like would spin the wheel and change your life. Some people of the period also believed in the four elements and the, the, the four elements resulting in, in, in four different humours in characters. So for instance, if your element was earth um, and you were melancholy, then your personality would be kind of cold and dry. Um, if you were choleric, um, like for instance, um, Fortinbras is described by Hamlet as of unimproved metal, hot and full. He's fiery and he's hot and dry, just like fire. So depending on which um, liquid was running through your body in, in greater quantity, uh, that affected how your temperament was shaped. Uh, so the belief was that simply by fixing up that balance, you could then um, restore your psychological well-being. In conjunction with these beliefs, um, people of the 1500s also believed in the divine right of kings, which essentially was, was the idea that the king was the supreme upholder of, of order on the earth, and if you were to remove the king from, from the earthly um, running of things, then again we would end up with a chaotic, chaotic society. So this is kind of how context comes to play in, in Hamlet. Um, you'll have elements and references to all of these uh, various um, older belief systems within the play. Um, and, and the idea is not that we want you to kind of say, oh yes, here uh, we can clearly see that in 1537 such and such happened. But rather the context is part of shaping the philosophy and the belief system that Shakespeare is kind of testing out in his play. Um, and we'll see how he holds these kind of medieval values up against a more modern Renaissance way of thinking. Um, and I guess we those ideas, if we bring them together <coughs> in its in their revised form, then the, the testing and the thinking that Hamlet that Shakespeare does in Hamlet is what we today would call humanism. He tests out what is the potential of man to shape his own universe and what's his role in the universe. And that's kind of what the ideas of humanism are about. So as we discussed in class the other day, Hamlet is written somewhere between 1599 and 1601. Some critics even hold him up to 1603. Uh, and obviously we talked about the Ur Hamlet, which potentially could be written by Shakespeare and which originates somewhere in 1550. But in terms of the play that we're studying, um, say somewhere between 1599 and 1601. Which more or less brings it up to the end of the reign of Elizabeth I. Uh, obviously Elizabeth reigned until 1603, so definitely while Hamlet was written. <coughs> but all the way through her, her life, people were already contemplating the succession and what was going to happen when she passed away. Because obviously Elizabeth had no heir, and so people were concerned about what would happen. In his biography on Shakespeare, uh, author Bill Bryson says that even while Elizabeth survived, the issue of her succession remained a national preoccupation throughout her reign, and that's through a good part of William Shakespeare's life. A quarter of Shakespeare's plays would be built around questions of royal succession. The speculating about Elizabeth's successor was very much against the law. So having looked at these medieval belief systems, we can then see, um, look at a few, um, what Michael Evans calls revolutions that happened during that era and that really uh, impacted significantly on the way that humans perceived themselves and the way that they saw human ability to measure the universe. And these three revolutions were of three different natures. One was a shift in geographical knowledge. One was a shift in cosmolo cosmological knowledge. And one was a shift in theological thinking. So the geographical shift was in, in the way that we perceive the world. So this is an, an OT map, uh, which is dated in 1472. Um, so you can see that the, the, uh, on the outskirts of this map... Uh, the Mare Oceanum, so the World Ocean, and then in here we have the Mediterranean Ocean, which sits this is the T. This is why it's called an OT map because we've got the two World Oceans there, the the Mare Oceanum and the Mediterranean um, as the O and the T. And then the belief was that everything else up here was Asia, uh, Europe was down here, and Africa was on the other side, and that was the extent of the world. 
So that world map obviously had to be discontinued when in 1492 Christopher Columbus set off across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, which was thought to be the Mario Zion, and hoping to pop out on the other side uh, towards Asia and India. Uh, and instead he had hit the West Indies, uh, and then you know we've attributed him with discovering what we call America today. Uh, and that obviously set off the Age of Explorers, where they people ex went off and explored various areas around the world. Uh, and this is what the world map looked like in 1570, so 70 years uh, after that OT map we looked at. So it's interesting to note that what used to be the world was this small little circle in here. And now we're looking at, at this enormous world map. And it's also now obviously shifted direction. Um, what used to be up is now over on this side. Uh, and what used to be left has now become the up. The cosmological shift was, in, in one sense, even greater. Um, and it really it happened with... Copernicus publishing in 1543 his book The Revolution of the Celestial Orbs because that shifted um, the perception of the universe from being a geocentric to being a heliocentric universe. So what we looked at before was was a world that was centered on the earth uh, and now instead the sun became the center of the, of the universe and obviously um, <clears throat> making people on earth <coughs> feel all the more insignificant and inferior. Uh, in the same book he also uh, throws in the idea that the universe is suddenly uh, an infinite and not a finite entity. So that idea of just um, essentially the stars that we can see are glued onto some sort of external firmament uh, was also abolished by Copernicus, or disputed at least, if not disproved. The theological revolution should more accurately be named the Reformation. Um, and that essentially was started in 1517 when Martin Luther uh, nailed up his 95 Theses on the church door of Wittenberg Cathedral in Germany. <coughs> and obviously Wittenberg is the church, sorry, the university where Hamlet and Horatio goes to school. Uh, so obviously this is very much alluded to throughout the play. Uh, so that's Luther started in 1517. In 1535, Henry VIII followed suit and declared himself head of the Anglican Church. So he reformed, uh, stepped England away from Catholicism and set up the Anglican Church. Um, his son um, remained loyal to his father's beliefs. So in 15, uh, up to 1554, uh, England remained Anglican. However, when, <coughs> when Mary Tudor took over the throne, um, she restored Catholicism. Uh, and commenced five years of essentially prosecution, um, well, persecution, but also prosecution of anyone refusing to return to Catholicism. So she's also known as Bloody Mary, you may know, um, partly because of uh, the decapitation of people who were stoic in their Anglicanism at the time. Um, then her sister came to power in 1558, and she was a Protestant, and so she, the Catholic, now became the persecuted minority. Uh, Elizabeth is not famous for being as brutal, but it was certainly not allowed to go out and, and try to convert people to Catholicism, um, and to some extent th there were executions of Catholics during Elizabeth's reign as well. Reign as well. Um, the Catholic Church was trying to stop this and obviously trying to restore England uh, into its rule. So in 1570, a papal bull was issued. Um, so the Pope wrote a letter sort of to all Catholics of the world saying um, this queen is, incite, um, is someone who needs to be stopped. So he was trying to incite a rebellion in England uh, and organize an assassination. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, and so in 1588, the Catholic Armada was launched from Spain to try to invade England and thereby defeat Elizabeth. <coughs> but again, um, partly weather and partly the English Navy uh, stopped the Armada from, from coming to England. Um, and what instead happened was we, we kind of got this internal split um, where the Anglican Church broke into Lutheran and Calvinist and Anabaptist and, and obviously remnants of Catholic churches, all claiming to be the true representation of Christianity, all within England. Uh, and obviously some of them uh, later on moving off to America for that religious freedom. Um, and you may have heard in 1605 of the gunpowder plot um, 
which um, Guy Fawkes was meant to, to light uh, the fuse and blow up Parliament and the King at the time. So the play Hamlet essentially becomes a melting pot for these old medieval feudal values and more contemporary Renaissance humanist ideas. And Hamlet is, Shakespeare is testing those ideas out against each other in the play. So that brings us to the end of the video and to your little thinking activity for Monday's lesson. I want you to think about how would it affect you if you were living in a world that had gone through these shifts in thinking. Write a brief description of what a man or woman in England in the early 17th century might have felt, feared and hoped. If it, if it helps you to kind of pull that together, you can use the thinking routine that we used um, the other lesson for one of Frost's poems. So you can once again use the step inside routine which is simply this. Think about what does the person know or believe? What is the person perceiving about the world around him? And what is the person caring about? And there might be a shift in these from what they knew and believed and cared about beforehand. Uh, and then they, they kind of have these revelations or these things explained to them and suddenly uh, a whole new world uh, opens up to them. So see, try to use that uh, as your scaffold for your thinking, and then write that brief description of what a man or woman might think about in that era. And obviously, as always, if you've got any questions, bring those to class as well, and we'll chat about all this on Monday, when we enter into Act 1, Scene 1 of the play.